All right, good afternoon, everyone. And we are going to have group four present the Marie Ecosystem, which is about? Mangrove Ecosystem. Beautiful. Take it away, Nadia. All right. Okay, so hi and good afternoon, everyone. Today we will start off with the introductions to mangrove forest. Eh, sorry, uh, today we will focus on our topic, which is mangrove ecosystems. So we will start off with the introductions to mangrove forests and mangrove plants. Mangrove forests are vegetated tidal habitat that consists of salt tolerant trees and shrubs, which grows in marine coastal environments. Coastal environments include wetlands such as estuaries and deltas. And in Malaysia, there are mangroves est mangrove estuaries such as Estuary Kuala Besar in Kelantan and Sungai Merbok Estuary in Penang. Moving on, uh, mangrove plants does not only comprise of trees and shrubs, but also palms and ground ferns. These plants thrive in, thrives in loose wet, wet soils and sedimented areas with low lo oxygen levels and also grow above the sea level and below the highest tides. Next, we move on to the mangrove distribution. Location-wise, they are found in altitudes of 0 degrees to 25 degrees from the equator or between 25 degrees south and 25 degrees north. Besides that, the distribution of mangroves uh, decreases as the altitude increases. So they will usually be found uh, between, this, uh, be, be, between these regions. Sorry. Uh, however, there are certain species such as Aveni, Ave, Avicennia marina that can grow up to 38 degrees far towards the south, which is way above the range of 25, uh, 0 degrees to 25 degrees. Next, uh, most mangrove species are located in the tropical and subtropical areas, and it is likely that most mangrove can grow in or thrive in areas besides tropical and subtropi subtropical areas, as they are sensitive to changes in temperature. For example, a fluctuation of 10 degrees Celsius can actually damage and kill some mangrove species such as uh, Brugaria sesangula. Mangrove, dis uh, mangrove species are also distributed in zonations. As you can see, there are three zonations, fringing zone, intermediate zone, and also landward zone. For fringing zone, mangrove exists and distributed along the edges of rivers. Next, for the intermediate zone, mangrove plants exist in deeper parts of the mangrove forest and there are lesser true mangrove species in this zone compared to fringing zone. Uh, for landward zone, it is located deeper into the mangrove forest uh, but they are closer to terrestrial forest and terrestrial plants. Moving on, uh, these are the location for tropical which is uh, Matang Mangrove Forest Reserve in Perak and River Kelantan Delta, uh, River Kelantan Delta in Tumpat, Kelantan. Uh, most mangrove species are located in tropical and subtropical areas. The Matang Mangrove Forest Reserve in Perak is actually uh, one of the largest mangrove tract which comprise of 440,000 hectares and is one of the largest mangrove forest reserves. For subtropical areas, uh, it is located in Ilna Grande Mangrove in Bertioga, Brazil. And this is one of the satellite view of the area and its coordinates. Next, I would like to talk about the distribution of mangroves which are affected by four uh, factors, which are salinity, climate, fluctuation of tides and type of soil. Mangroves prefer and are most found abundantly in areas with harsh waters with high salinity. This is because it is an important factor for propagul germination, seedling growth and also reproduction. Next, mangroves are also halophytes where they are found in high salinity areas to reduce competition of other resources with different species of plants. Mangroves are mostly found in warm climate However, with climate change and increase in temperature, mangroves are also starting to distribute to regions of higher altitudes. Next is fluctuation of tides and types of soil. Different species of mangrove are located in different areas 
based on their ability to tolerate certain abiotic factors like salinity and pH levels of soil or oxygen content, which is why different mangrove species are also available in different zonations as I've shown uh, in the earlier slide. There are three zonations. For example, uh, Avi Avicennia species can tolerate soils with lower levels of oxygen, which is why they are most fun, most, uh, they are found mostly in fringing zones. And now I will pass on to Udina to continue with marine organisms and plants available in mangrove ecosystem. Okay, hello and good evening. Uh, okay, first of all, we're going to talk about the mangrove plants. There are roughly 54 true species of mangrove plants from 16 different families. The Southeast Asia has an approximate coverage of 35% of the world's mangrove. The true species is defined by Tom Nixon 2016 as mangrove plants that are found and grow only in mangrove forests, has ecological importance to the mangrove environment, has unique morphology specialized for mangrove community, and the last one, it has specialized mechanism for salt exclusion. So some of the examples of true species includes the Avicennia species, and it can be found in the fringing zone. The second one is the rhizophora, uh, rhizophora can be found in the intermediate zone. And the last one is the Bruguiria, and commonly found in the landward zone. <clears throat> Next, for the marine organism, the first one is called the Aratus pisoni, or commonly known as the mangrove tree crab. It usually lives in the canopy part of the mangrove. The most common food source for the mangrove tree crab is the Rhizophora mango, or the red mangrove. Other than that, uh, it will also feed on the leaves of the black mangrove and the white mangrove. This uh, mangrove tree crab consume part of the leaf by scraping the surface of it and it will leave, leave behind some damage on the mangrove leaves. Mangrove tree crabs will also prey on small arthropods when it can manage to catch, to catch one. It will use this as, as a supplement for its main food of red mangrove leaves. The second one is the Lutroger persipicillata. It's also known as a smooth-coated otter. The species can be found in the mangrove habitats in peninsular Malaysia, and they usually feed on fish, shellfish, and crustaceans. And the last one is Gobi Day. It's also called the mudskipper. Usually can be found in the mangrove habitats within soil sediment. The mudskipper population is quite large because there are many small crustaceans available in the mangrove area as their prey. The mudskippers are perhaps the most conspicuous fish in our mangrove, mainly because they spend most of their time out of water. They are uniquely adapted among fishes for terrestrial activity as they can breathe by holding water in their mouth and gill chamber and replace it with fresh water when it becomes deoxygenated. By staying them, the mudskipper can also breathe through its skin. That's all for me, thank you. Okay, next is unique adaptation and physical features. First adaptation is salt tolerance. Higher salt content interferes with the metabolic, uh, metabolic rate of mangrove that can lead to stem growth of the mangrove plant. Based on the study, mangrove plants will also help trouble extracting water from the soil when the salinity is high. Mangrove can adapt to high salinity by um, salt excretion through leaf. Salt is transported through the mangrove plant in the xylem to the leaf. Leaf on mangrove have salt glands on the surface of the leaf to secrete their excess and unwanted salt. Once the salt is excreted, the leaf will fall off from the tree and turn into biomass. Salt also is stored in vehicles with the help of specialized tissue of the leaf before the leaf dies and drops. In some species of mangrove, salt is excreted from the bark of stem and pneumatophore. Next adaptation is sedimentation and water logging. It can occur during long periods of high tide. Water logging lowers oxygen level in the root zone. Excess sedimentation can form the root which can prevent mangrove plants from respirating. Mangroves have different and unique root structures to aid in over overcoming sedimentation and water logging difficulties such as pneumatophore, which allow mangrove to absorb gas directly from the atmosphere and other nutrients such as iron from the poor soil. Uh, next, I'll pass to Mohi. Okay, 
test test one two test test all clear all right so i'll be all clear yeah yes all right thank you so i'll be talking about the ecological functions ecological function is divided into three the first one is uh how mangrove helps humans uh first it provides food for us humans. Mangroves have very rich biodiversity and high levels of productivity, supplying us with especially seafoods. For instance, fish, crabs, they all grow in mangroves. Next, mangroves also provide us with medications, uh, usually used by mangrove dwellers, dwellers people who go into mangroves. Uh, for example, they use Acanthus illicifolius for skin disorders and wounds. Luminate Zera can also be used for skin disorders and treating sores. Uh, second ecological function is in terms of envi environment. Mangroves protect coastal areas from erosions. It stabilizes our shoreline by absorbing wave actions and reduce wave amplitude, uh, meaning that it makes waves less stronger when it crash into the shore. So it saves us from uh, erosions. Uh, mangroves have root system that hold the sediments firm, uh, and so uh, the energy from the ocean uh, spread back into the oceans. This, in terms, help prevent damage to other ecosystems such as coral reefs. Uh, for, I mean, less sediment will smother the corals, of course. Next, in terms of environment, is maintain water quality and clarity. Mangroves can filter pollutants and traps sediments that come from lands. So sediments from land like waste cannot pollute the ocean because mangrove trap them first. Uh, second, uh, mangrove is also nursery for marine wildlife and other organisms. Like I said before, fish and crabs. Uh, juvenile fish like lemon sharks. Do you know that lemon sharks can go to rivers? Uh, lobster, salmon, all of them spend their baby years in mangrove because mangrove have high rich it's rich with foods before they go to the sea and that's all for me uh, i pass the next one to the next person thank you okay as for the case study we have chose the study of the long-term assessment of an innovative mangrove rehabilitation project the case study on curry islands malaysia so the objective of this case study is to introduce an innovative shoreline protection scheme using mangrove and ecology engineering methods in order to minimize the environmental impact. As for the methods, this, uh, this research was performed five years earlier by replanting mangrove in the Kari Island Banting, Selangor. The area was chosen as it faced serious erosion threats and also forest degradation. Other than that, they also built a break breakwater system to aid in the mangrove replantation. As for the result and discussion, after the replantation, they found out that the bathymetric properties has enhanced, such as the slate and clay content have increased in percentage. The bathymetric data also showed there is an increase in the parameter of the coastal areas as there are less erosion uh, compared to the four years uh, before the project. That's all from this. Thank you. Well done, group four. I can see why the enthusiasm was there. <laughs> Doctor, I also would like to add on something. Oh, please do. We actually did a summary of our presentation mm -hmm. in of this. It's a much more compact mind map rather than the one we presented earlier. So these are more on points and what we presented just now was the explanation of our points. Ah, this is beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. I would like to encourage all other groups to do such, but then they might start cursing you guys soon. No, um, actually, this is a great <laughs> job, but I really appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. Good job, Group 4. Okay, thank you, Doctor. All right, and I call upon next group. Uh, what is the next group? Thank you, uh, Group 1. Which is about? Uh, Rocky Shaw. All right, take it away, Rocky Shaw people. Group 1. Go on, go on. Hello? 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 Dengar, I can hear you loud and clear. Hello, good afternoon all. We from group 1 will be presenting about Rocky Shaw. Uh, 
Uh, next slide. Okay, what is Rocky Shore? Rocky Shore is defined as a coastal area with a solid rock foundation. It is the home for a number of different animal and algae. The Rocky Shore ecosystem is governed by the tidal movement of water. So ecosystem on a rocky shore have a different species across the intertidal zone from above high tide to subtidal zone. Different species are adapted to different environmental condition. Some organism can withstand being exposed to the sun for most of the day and live in the upper part of the rocky shore. And other organism need to be covered by the tide for most of the day and are only found lower on the rocky shore. Okay, next for the location of rocky shore locally and internationally, I will pass to Aiman. Um, okay, so uh, rocky shore can be found all around the world. An example that can be uh, of rocky shore that can be found in Malaysia is Teluk Aling in Pulau Pinang, Tanjung Jara in Terengganu and Teluk Bidara in Terengganu. Next slide please. And uh, next slide. And Another example of rocky shore that can be found outside of Malaysia in international waters are Costa Vicentina in Portugal and the coast along Queensland in Australia. So next will be defined what just me. Um, okay, so for my turn, I will be explaining on the marine marine animals that can be found in rocky shore ecosystems and its unique features on how they um, tolerate with the condition. So first we have an Australian sea lion which is also known as Neofoca cinerea. So uh, the unique features is that this group of sea lions they are they breed on land. Okay so why is this important for the rocky shore ecosystem is because um, pups are more closer to its parent so predators are less numerous. This is because uh, land breeding on rocky shores are often found crowded and rockers on offshore islands and rocky beaches. Rockers meaning uh, they are loud. So this, uh, the whole population reduces the predation upon, upon their young. Is that the next one? Uh, for the second animal, it's the New Zealand common cushion star. Okay, so did you know that New Zealand common cushion star is found in a wide range of coastal habitats, but they are most common, um, but they are found most common along rocky shore. So uh, it is also known as Pateriella regularis, and they are actually um, well adapted for their feeding mechanism because they are opportunistic omnivores and they feed on a variety of organisms such as algae, barnacles and invertebrates. So why is this a unique feature for uh, this common cushion star? It's because they capture food by inflating its cushion uh, and deflates on top of its prey which uh, are found widely on rocks. Okay. So the next one, okay, so for the third animal uh, is sea slaters or also known as Ligia, okay. So why are they um, able to live in rocky shore ecosystems is because of its rapid movement. They have seven pair of legs allowing them to move very quickly. So this allows them to avoid the waves and splashes but often found during low tides and this also avoid them from uh, predators. So the next one. For the plant, okay, we have a parsley weed also known as Gigantina alviata and they are specialized, I mean sorry, they have specialized basal structure. Uh, what is that? Is that they have a hold fast. So the hold fast allows them to attach themselves on hard surfaces like rocks. And so this allows them to actually um, thrive in this rocky ecosystems because they will obtain the necessary nutrients from the water surrounding them. Okay, next. Okay, for the second one, we have a rubber weed. 
uh, also known as Apophleia lyalli. Okay, so why are they very unique is that they are very resistant to various stress such as um, ultraviolet radiation, salinity, and even desiccation. Um, they can um, withstand a period of time of desiccation because their branches are rounded, dark red, and bushy with firm texture. They can absorb water too. So that's why they can uh, withstand desiccation times. Okay, for the last one. For the last uh, main plant is that we have lichens. So what are actually lichens is that they perform symbiotic relationship between a fungus and with a algae or bacteria or sometimes it can be both. So what makes them unique is that because of the symbiotic relationship. So the fungus, they are relatively thick on the outer surface. So this protects lichen from harsh environments such as um, strong waves. Okay, uh, and also uh, because of the fungus itself, uh, fungus are able to absorb water three to thirty-five times its weight for storage due to numerous projection projections uh, of the fungus to the rock. So on the left side, we can see the uh, cross section of the fun uh, of the lichens on the fungal side. So that is all from me. I will pass to everybody. All right. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, what are the abiotic factors or the physical factors that affect the animals that are living on the rocky shore. All right. So first, uh, we have uh, the wave. So since uh, the rocky shore area are the, the area that is nearer to the uh, shore, so they are greatly affected by the rise and fall of tides. All right. So uh, this actually affect the mobility of many predators and prey because unlike in open sea or in, or in any other places, so uh, because of the tides is so heavy, uh, so most of the animals, they can't move uh, freely, right? And then next, uh, we have uh, the temperature, All right? So the temperature around Rocky Shore area is actually uh, really volatile, meaning to say that uh, it might get uh, really, really hot during the afternoon, which is why, uh, as Jasmine mentioned earlier, that Roly Poly has a lot of uh, lakes because it makes them uh, easier to, uh, faster to run away from the sun. And actually, colder temperature at Rocky Shore area has a significant impact on the nutrient availability and also to the dissolved oxygen level. So, as uh, we might have, uh, as we might have learned, that uh, the temperature of the water actually affect the concentration of dissolved oxygen and also uh, the concentration of nutrients that are available to the organisms in that area. Uh, we also have uh, sunlight. So sunlight actually affects the rate of primary productivity. And because uh, because uh, the rocky shore areas actually uh, get a lot of sunlight during, uh, during uh, afternoon, so most marine animals actually have adapted to avoid the sun, uh, to avoid the sun. Some animals like uh, some animals like uh, how to say clams uh, and rock oysters, uh, because of the tides and also because of the high, uh, because the hot sun, they actually have adapted to close and store water inside of their shells. And next we have uh, salinity. So as I already mentioned earlier, this is the closest uh, to the uh, to the land area. So salinity will fluctuate over the day because of tides. And also during a uh, during a rainy season, uh, water from the water coming from uh, the uh, inland area might seep into the rocky shore area. So this will also fluctuate the salinity. This will affect the rate of osmosis uh, for marine animals. And compared to the other environment, rocky shore organisms are actually proven to be more resilient to uh, salinity changes. Next, we also have a case study. So this is an article uh, came out from Forbes. So uh, uh, in this article, they have discovered that uh, ocean plastic is actually now uh, forming crust on rocky shore. So why is this uh, very bad things, right? So uh, because of the rocky shore areas, uh, some of the rocky shore area actually serve as a nursery area for other animals, right? And uh, 
the organisms that are on the rocky shore, uh, they are also, some of them are at the bottom of the food chain. So, by, uh, as you can see, maybe uh, it's not very clear in the picture there, but some of the Litronidae, ataupun uh, snail species, uh, actually uh, graze on this uh, ocean plastic and they might also accidentally, accidentally take in uh, microplastics that, were, that, were, that are forming on the rocky shore. So, uh, this will lead to a bioaccumulation where on the trophic level, uh, the uh, when other animals eat, uh, ah, you can see the snails there, right? So when other animals eat these animals at the bottom of the trophic level, so it will become uh, the plastic, the harmful plastic will accumulate over time and across the trophic level. So at the end of the day, even in the fishes that are in the open seas, they will end up with plastics uh in their stomach as well right so uh and also most of the plastic actually can absorb toxins uh in the environment okay i think that's it from our uh that's it from our group today thank you ah oh, that's a beautiful one group uh what group one can you from group no. honestly it was very nice no i like the last part especially the case study good job thank you so much no um, okay, so what's the next group? Hello. Where, yeah, Irfan? Hello. Hello. Next group is group Jennifer. Hello. Okay, so you're going with number 11, which is on Northern Group Pro 11, okay. yes. <laughs> Take it away, Jennifer. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Mels and fellow classmates. So I am from group 11, and our group will be present, be talking about the northern polar region. So, for the first one, I'll tell you about the definition about the northern polar region, which is the northern polar region is characterized by extreme seasonal of light and year-round ice cover. So, for the next, next, um, I'll be talking about the location. So, for the location of the northern polar region. I will briefly explain about the Arctic and Antarctic, which Arctic is the sea surrounded by land while the Antarctic is land surrounded by sea. So the biggest difference is that the Arctic is sea surrounded by land while the Antarctic is land surrounded by sea. So next, this is the map of the northern polar region. As you can see in the middle is the north polar. So as I said before, it is a sea surrounded by land. Next. And this is the full view of the map and the real world example of the northern polar region, um, which are consists of, as you can see, um, at the upper side, which is the subarctic. Next. Which consists of eight different location of real world example of the northern polar, which is the Canada, Sweden. USA, USA, which is in the Alaska, Norway, Greenland, Finland, Russia, and Iceland. Next. All right. I'll pass to Hazik. Okay. For the marine organism, next. Marine organism that can be found in the polar regions is polar bear versus maritimus. Next. Belugan whale, Delphinapterus locus. Next. For the Venus Rosmarus, which is Walrus, next. Monodon Monoceros, Narwhal, next. Usa Hispida, Ring Seal, next. Plankton, for the zooplankton, Ant Antartomyces Maxima, and Phytoplankton, Melosira Artica, next. Seaweed, Agarum Clatratum, next. Seagrass, Sustera marina. Next. For the physical features of the ecosystem. The, the first one is sunlight. In the northern polar region, there is no sunlight for half a year during winter season, which limits the types of plants that can grow in this environment. During summer, presence of sunlight increases the productivity of this, of this region rapidly. For the temperature, Temperature is, a, is important for the formation of ice in the polar region. Increase in temperature can cause the polar ice cap to melt, resulting in increase in the sea level. 
Melting ice also cause trouble for other animals to find food and shelter. Ice. Cool temperature cause the formation of ice, which is important habitat for organism in polar region. Animals such as polar bear lives and hunt on ice while seal use ice as a resting place. Ocean current. Ocean currents carry nutrients and small organisms that form the food supply for organisms of this ecosystem. Nutrient-dense water at the bottom of the ocean is brought to the surface by upwelling currents to provide resources to surface-dwelling animals. These are unique characteristics of the ecosystem. Will be explained by... Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Next is the unique uh, physical features of the organism in polar region and its adaptation. First, we go for the polar bear. Uh, two coats of fur and thick layer of fur help insulate the polar bear's body from the cold temperature. Polar bear's paws are adapted for walking on the ice and swimming in the sea. Hairs and bumps on the soles of their feet provide traction, while webbing between their toes allow for effective swimming strokes. Next, next is beluga whale. It has a very thick layer of blubber, thick skin, relatively small tail flux and pectoral flippers and absence of a dorsal fin are adaptation for life in cold water. Next is walrus. Walrus have a thick layer of blubber that can be up to four inches thick. To keep their vital organs and core warm, blood will be shuttled off from the surface of their skin, making them appear white and pale. Walrus also have large tusks to be used to pull themselves up on ice, breaking ice for breathing holes and to show dominance over other males. Narwhal. Narwhals are able to survive in cold waters because of their thick layer of blubber that retains heat. The grayish color camouflages in the Arctic waters and helps them to protect from predators. Narwhals also rely on their tusks for protection and feeding. Next, ring seal. Physiological adaptation helps them make deep, sustained dives, reaching deeps of 300 feet and remaining submerged for up to 45 minutes. But before surfacing, they sometimes block bubbles up their breathing hole to check for polar bears, their main predator. Next, I'll pass to Jennifer. Uh, next, we'll see the unique characteristics or adaptation for marine plants in northern polar region. First of all, plankton. When sea ice melts in the Arctic, the ice leaves behind a layer of fresh water on the ocean surface that is full of nutrients. Another source of nutrient-rich water appears when cold, dense polar water sinks to the ocean bottom, forcing deep, nutrient-laden water to the surface. This event caused the population of plankton blooming. During winter, most of the plankton undergoes hibernation because of the lack of nutrients. Other than that, seaweed in specific kelps have adapted to severe conditions. In regions with cold nutrient-rich water, they can attain some of the highest rate of primary production. They rely on flowing water to provide a consistent supply of nutrients for photosynthesis. When water runs past the blades, the serrated edges aid in water mixing. As for seagrass, by stabilizing soil and buffering wave action, eelgrass beds filter excess nutrients from the water and help avoid shoreline flooding and erosion. The appearance of eelgrass is an indication of good water quality since it needs specific quantities of light and clean water. As for the case study, we found a research published stating that biofluorescent fish have been spotted in Arctic waters and they're a little unusual. Biofluorescent is where organisms absorb low wavelength light and emits high wavelength light that makes it glow in a dark environment. From this research, a snailfish was found emitting biofluorescent light during long periods of night. Biofluorescent organisms need light uh, low wavelength to be absorbed for emission of high light wavelength to glow. Usually, biofluorescence somehow present during the long periods of day at Arctic. Apart from that, the snailfish also fluoresce in red and green color simultaneously, 
but in most cases, marine fish tend to fluoresce in single color. So that's all from our group. Uh, thank you very much, um, Group 11. This is first really nice. I like the theme that you had. It does give the Christmas vibe. Uh, and you guys had some really nice um, 